Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I lost my hearing after that takbir, mashallah. That was awesome. Can we do that one more time? Takbir! Mashallah, we should just do that for the rest of the night. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. I want you to imagine the scene with me. Imagine going to the Kaaba, to Masjid Al-Haram in Mecca, and you can put it in your head if you've been to Umrah or been to Hajj, and that Kaaba is right in front of you. And I want you to remember the first time you saw it, if you've seen it. Now I want you to imagine a Kaaba that had never had the Quran recited next to it. A Kaaba surrounded by idols. A Kaaba that was nothing like the Kaaba that we know today. It was both it was both infiltrated with idols inside and outside. And I want you to imagine the very first time Quran gets recited in public. And it wasn't by Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu like you might think. It wasn't by the rich Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. It wasn't by Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu or Uthman al-Ghani radiallahu anhu. It was a little man by the name of Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who was very, very short physically, but a giant in Islam. A young man that had no tribal protection, whose mother's name is unknown to us, who belongs to the lowest socio-economic class in society, and he goes, to, he goes to the middle of the haram, right next to the Kaaba, where reciting the Qur'an is banned. And suddenly he starts to recite and he starts to use his hands while he's reciting to describe his ayat. He goes to the middle, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and the people are looking at him wondering what he's going to do. And in the middle of it all, he starts to recite, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Ar-Rahman Allama al-Qur'an Khalaq al-Insan Allamahu al-Bayan Al-Shamsu wal-Qamaru bi-Husban Wal-Najmu wal-Shajaru yasjudan وَالسَّمَاءَ رَفَعَهَا وَوَضَعَ الْمِيزَانَ As he's reciting Surah Ar-Rahman, he's describing Ar-Rahman, the most merciful. عَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ He taught us the Qur'an. خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ He created man. عَلَّمَهُ الْبَيَانَ He taught him expression. الشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرُ بِحُسْبَانَ وَالنَّجْمُ وَالشَّجَرُ يَسْجُدَانَ the sun and the moon are in orbit. Every system that Allah created functions in exactly the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created it to function. And as this young man is reading, the people were not familiar with the Qur'an and they didn't know what he was chanting. At first they thought it was poetry. Then they realized he was reciting the Qur'an. And it's no secret or it's no... It, it's, there, there is no... There's no reason why he would recite anything but Surah Ar-Rahman, of which the first verse after the Most Merciful is, he taught the Qur'an. And they jumped on him radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And they stepped on him. They tied him to the ground, and they actually started to walk on his face. Abu Jahl, who was the biggest one amongst them, he had the size and the stature of Umar al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He walked up to Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu while he was on the ground. He took his cursed foot and he stomped in the collarbone of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu and broke it. And Abdullah bin Mas'ud was beaten unconscious. That was the first time the Qur'an had ever been recited publicly. When Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu woke up, after a long while, and his wounds were being treated. He asked the people what happened. And they told him, you went to the Kaaba, and you recited the Qur'an, 
and the people jumped on you and they beat you unconscious and they broke your bones. And Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, Insha'Allah, I'm going to do the same thing tomorrow. He's still laying down. He has no protection in society. They almost killed him. And he says, you know what? I'm going to go and I'm going to recite the same thing tomorrow. They said to him, why? لَقَدْ أَسْمَعْتَهُمْ مَا يكرهون. You already caused them to hear what they hate to hear. You already did your job. And he says, Wallahi, مَا كَانَ أَعْدَاءُ اللَّهِ أَهْوَنَ عَلَيَّ مِنْ يَوْمِ هَذَا He said, I swear by Allah that the enemies of God have never been weaker and smaller in my eyes than they are today. I'm not afraid of them. I'll go back and I'll read again. This is not some fictional story or the little engine that could. This is a companion of the Prophet ﷺ who would one day step on Abu Jahl, the man who broke his collarbone and end his life. This is the man who would become known for the Qur'an himself. مَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يَسْمَعَ الْقُرْآنَ غَدًّا طَرِيًّا كَمَا أُنزِلَ The Prophet ﷺ said, if you want to hear the Qur'an like it was revealed. You know what that means? The scholars say, the way that it was revealed from Jibreel alayhi salam to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when you listen to Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu read, it is as if it's not human. It's an angel reciting. If you want to hear the Qur'an as if it was just revealed, listen to the qira'ah, listen to the recitation of Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The fact that even after he went out, and he recited the Qur'an when it was banned. He was beaten almost to death. And after that episode, not only, not only was he not scared, he was renewed. Not only were his enemies not daunting to him, they were weaker. Because the sign of a weak person is that the way they respond to revelation, the way they respond to logic, the way they respond to the words of the Creator, is insults and abuse because they have nothing intellectual to say. The only way they can respond is with violence. The only way they can respond is with fear mongering because that's all they have. So they try to ban the Quran. That didn't work. They tried to persecute the Muslims. That didn't work. They tried to ban the Muslims. That didn't work either. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says, that my father Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, just a few months before the hijrah to Medina, it had gotten unbearable in Mecca. And he decided to migrate to Abyssinia. And as he was on his way to Habasha, as he was on his way to Abyssinia, where there was a righteous Christian king that would recognize the revelation, not everybody rejected the revelation. Not everybody. Najashi, when he heard it, as Shaykh Yasir was saying, a pure-hearted person, tara a'yunuhum tafidu min ad-dam'ah. You would see their eyes well up with tears. They know it's the truth. They know it's the truth. They say, Rabbana amanna, O Allah, we believe. Faktubna ma'a shahideen. Write us down from amongst those who have bore witness to the truth of this revelation. Some people heard it and they were ready to go. And Najashi, radiallahu anhu, heard it, a scholar of Christianity. And he says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu annahu rasulullah, alladhi bashara bihi Isa ibn Maryam, wa lawla ma ana fihi min al mulk, la ataituhu li ahmila na'lihi. He said, I bear witness that there is only one God, and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his messenger. And had I not been in the state of being a king, if I had not been in this state that I am in right now, I would have gone to him to carry his sandals for him. Najashi sent 12 priests, according to Sa'id ibn Jubayr radiallahu anhu, to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to listen to him. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited Qur'an to them. And all 12 of them broke down into tears. Not everyone responded to the revelation in such a way, but some of them couldn't handle it. Because the Qur'an was too politically incorrect. Because the Qur'an ch challenged their immoral ways of living. They couldn't handle that. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, just a few months before Medina, he set out to Habasha, to Abyssinia. And on his way there, a man by the name of Ibn Daghina, who was the chief of a tribe, he stopped him and he said, where are you going? Abu Bakr did not respond with insecurity. He didn't respond seeking sympathy. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, 
my people have turned me away. He says, فَأَسِيحُ فِي الْأَرْضِ I'm going to go explore the earth. وَأَعْبُدُ رَبِّي And I'm going to go worship my Lord. He didn't respond with humiliation. He responded with dignity. He said, I'm going to go find a place where I can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without being bothered. Ibn al-Daghina said, a person like you, Abu Bakr, لا يخرج ولا يخرج. That's beautiful. You should not be made to leave, nor should you be allowed to leave, even if you wanted to leave. You're too beneficial to society. You take care of people. You take care of orphans. You're good to your neighbors. A person like you should never be rejected from a society. In fact, we can't afford to lose you from our society. So he took Abu Bakr and he said, you're in my protection. فَطَافَ عَلَىٰ أَشْرَافِ قريش. He went to the leaders of Quraysh. And he said, listen, this man, لا يخرج ولا يخرج. He should not leave, nor should, nor should he be allowed to leave, even if he wanted to leave. And they responded and they said, look, if he's going to stick around, and he's not going to recite the Qur'an publicly, he'll worship Allah in his house, we're fine with that. They don't care if you're Muslim or not. As long as you're not challenging society's norms. Recite the Qur'an in your house. But we're afraid of our women and children being affected by Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. We don't want them to hear his recitation. And Aisha radiallahu anha says that Abu Bakr used to worship Allah in his house. Then Abu Bakr came up with an idea. He turned half of his house into an open courtyard. And he started to recite the Qur'an then. Reciting the Qur'an was an act of civil disobedience. وَجَاهِدْهُمْ بِهِ جِهَادًا كَبِيرًا One of the original mentions of jihad, the J-word, was to struggle by reciting the Qur'an publicly. That's one of the original manifestations. The message isn't going anywhere. And he recited in his courtyard. And as he recited in his courtyard, the women and the children and the people who had no agendas, they started to gather around and listen to the Qur'an and they were affected by it. The Qur'an, once again, was reaching the hearts of those who craved it. And so what did they do? They told Ibn al-Daghina, you've got to give up your protection. You can't do this. You can't let them do this. Ibn al-Daghina went to Abu Bakr. He said, listen, I can't be in this controversy. Either you stop reciting Qur'an openly, or I'm going to have to give up my protection. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu says, أَرُدُّ إِلَيْكَ جَوَارِكْ You can take your protection back. وَأَرْضَى بِجِوَارِ اللَّهِ I'm pleased with the protection of Allah. I don't need your protection. I have my dignity. I have my faith. I will continue to read the Qur'an publicly. I don't care. And subhanAllah, a few months later, they made their way to Medina. If you think about this, dear brothers and sisters, every single time they stood up against the Prophet ﷺ, and stood up against Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, and the Ibn Mas'uds of the world, every time they tried to kill the message, they ended up giving it more life. They ended up giving the believers more resilience. They ended up empowering the message. Because their response was a sign of their own defeat. Their response was the, was the response of the weak-minded and the ignorant. And that was a show that they were scared. And you know why they were scared? Because the Qur'an was coming to transform their society. They couldn't handle that. They don't want a message that's going to actually change society. That's actually going to affect people. And so they tried the fear-mongering. And every single time, it ended up coming back against them. And the Qur'an continued to flourish. And today, in that area, can you imagine next to the Kaaba, where a man was almost beaten to death because he recited the Qur'an. Think about that. At what point in time is there not a person reciting the Qur'an next to the Kaaba today? As much as they tried to stifle that message, look what happened to it. You know why? إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَيُؤَيِّدُ هَذَا الدِّينَ بِالرَّجُلِ الْفَاجِرِ Sometimes Allah gives victory to the religion through a, through a transgressor, through a wicked man. They think they're hindering the progress of this deen and they're actually giving it more life. يُرِيدُونَ لِيُطْفِئُوا نُورَ اللَّهِ بِأَفْوَاهِهِمْ وَاللَّهُ مُتِمُّ نُورِهِ وَلَوْ كَرِهَ الْكَافِرُونَ They try to extinguish the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with their understandings, but Allah preserves it. It's still there. Despite all the persecution, despite banning Muslims in Mecca, despite banning the recitation of the Qur'an, the message lived 
on. Because persecution will not stop this message. Persecution will not stop it. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was, was covered in guts and filth, and his daughter Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha had to wipe off the guts from his back. And he said, don't worry, this message is going to reach each and every single household and each and every single village and each and every single tent. It will spread, it will reach, nothing will stop that message. Now I want to bring this to a current context. How many of you have heard of Martin Luther King Jr.? Raise your hand. If you haven't heard of Martin Luther King Jr., take your other hand and... How many of you have heard of Malcolm X? Raise your hand. How many of you have heard of Medgar Evers? Raise your hand. Exactly. I want to tell you about a man by the name of Medgar Evers. I actually did a middle school project on him in Louisiana. In Louisiana. Medgar Evers was a civil rights activist in Mississippi. And he used to fight for desegregation in schools and he used to bring people to the, to the polls and bring people to the voter booths and he fought for social justice and he fought for desegregation against all odds. He was met with all sorts of violence, all sorts of threats, but that young man would not stop fighting for desegregation and for the rights of his people in Mississippi. In 1963, at the age of 38 years old, Evers, Medgar Evers came home and he pulled up into his driveway. And he, he was just coming from an activity and he was actually wearing a shirt that said, Jim Crow must be stopped. And as he's in his driveway in Mississippi, a Ku Klux Klansman walks up to him and assassinates him in his own driveway at the age of 38 years old. Evers staggered for about 30 feet, they say, as he literally was bleeding to death. His family came outside. They took him to a local hospital. And that hospital did not accept people of color even if they were bleeding to death. So he died. Two years later, Malcolm X, rahimahullah, at the age of 39 years old, he died. Three years later, 1968, Martin Luther King Jr., at the age of 39 years old, was killed. All three of these men were assassinated before they lived to see the age of 40. And you might think to yourself, what a sad ending. Evers' wife went on to actually become the head of the NAACP. And she actually gave the invocation at President Obama's second inauguration. Evers has a comment that he made that lives with me and should live with each and every single one of us until today. He said that you can kill a man, but you can't kill an idea. You can kill a man, but you can't kill an idea. You can persecute people, but you can't stop the message. You can persecute Muslims, but you won't stop the Qur'an and the light of the Qur'an from reaching every corner of the earth. You can assault the character of the Prophet ﷺ. And you know what? It's only until recently that Islamophobes dared to insult the character of the Prophet ﷺ. Because never in history did anyone have the audacity to open their mouths about the character of the Prophet ﷺ. But every time you open your mouth against him, you will only further expose people to his beauty. Those that need to find him and those that crave the light of guidance will find it and you can't stop it. Dear brothers and sisters, this is the meaning of Allah will give victory to the religion even if it's through a wicked man. Even those that think they're fighting Islam and fighting against our religion and trying to tarnish the character, the beautiful character of our Prophet ﷺ, all they are doing is they are causing us to historically institutionalize and fight bigotry in ways that we should have been doing a long time ago. The gathering that you saw here just about an hour ago, 
the U.S. Council of Muslim Organizations. That should have happened a long time ago. But sometimes adversity is what it takes. Sometimes the Islamophobes are what we need to get ourselves out of our comfort zone. So you know what? Alhamdulillah for Islamophobia. Thank God for Islamophobia that causes us to get our acts together. Alhamdulillah for the Islamophobia that causes us to organize the way we're supposed to organize. Alhamdulillah for the Islamophobia that causes us to develop a strong American Muslim identity in the face of xenophobia. But we have to send a clear message to these people and to these bigots that we are not not phased. We are not phased. We have, mashallah, tabarakallah, in Texas, armed white supremacist militia groups who ironically call us terrorists, protesting in front of our masajid with assault rifles. And they dip their bullets in bacon grease and, 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 the, and uh, the, the, a pig's blood so that if they shoot us, we can go straight to hell. And you know what? My six-year-old daughter had to see that. Our children are having to see that bigotry. Our children are having to see an America that embraces a xenophobe, or at least a man who can effectively pretend like a xenophobe and normalize xenophobia in Donald Trump. Our children are, have to, are having to see an America that accepts a person like that. But you know what? Their bullets that are dipped in pig's blood and bacon grease aren't going to send anyone to hell. But we have to stare people like that in the eye and say that your racism can go to hell. It's not welcome in our America. And whatever group it is, whether they wear the white robes and whether they're the Ku Klux Klan or whoever they are, we cannot show them that we are afraid. We cannot show them that we are afraid. We are not aggressors. We are not transgressors. We are not people that want harm for the society. We are people in this mini reconstruction of America that are pushing for the better vision of this country. A country that accepts and embraces differences. A country that accepts every community. A country that moves forward. A country that will no longer be, be doomed by its ugly past, a country that will move away from it. And even if they don't want to see it happen, it'll happen. Whether they like it or not, it will happen, dear brothers and sisters. And we can't show fear. We can't show insecurity. Don't let them see you scared. Don't let them see you afraid. Don't let them see you taking off your hijabs. Don't let them see you afraid to pray in public. Don't let them see you changing your names. Don't let them see you hiding your Islam. Because if they let you go, then they'll move on to another group. And you will be responsible for that. Your job is not just to deflect racism and xenophobia from your community, but from every community. So when you back away from your identity, then you're still allowing other people to be targeted for their identity. And dear brothers and sisters, I want to leave you with this one saying, or not this one saying, it's actually an incident, subhanAllah, I've spoken about it on social media because it really deeply moved me. Wallahi, it really moved me. I was up all night that night, and you don't have to believe that, but it really, really moved me to the core because it scared me. When I was at the World Religions Parliament, a Sikh man walked up to me. And when he introduced himself to me, and I introduced myself to him, he said, I hope, he said that Islamophobia has made us Sikhs better Sikhs. I hope it's making you better Muslims. Islamophobia has made us Sikhs better Sikhs. I hope it's making you better Muslims. That's a community, that's a community that's had to struggle and face the ugliness of Islamophobia and they're not even Muslim. What about you? What about me? What does that say about our community? What does that say about the way we should move forward? What it tells us is that we need to challenge bigotry. Not with ugliness and hatred, but by reciting the Qur'an and by showing that the message isn't going anywhere. And you know how the message is going to manifest itself? It's not going to manifest itself with big scary jihadis coming into your, into your home and shooting you with the uh, you know, Zabiha meat bullets or something like that. 
That's not how it's going to manifest itself. Not with terrorist training camps and, you know, not with any type of slavery coming back. No, none of that stuff. You know how it's going to manifest itself? With feed the homeless programs. With people going out and serving their communities. With Muslims being unafraid and unfazed to, be to, 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 to contribute to this community even as they're told they're not really a part of it. You are a part of it. The bigots will die out. The xenophobia will die out. That's what's not welcome in our country. And we collectively have to stand against that and realize the Quran has faced bigger challenges than this. Our deen has faced bigger challenges than this. Muslims has faced bigger challenges than this in the past. But here we are 1400 years later with a conference about the Quran. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us people of Quran and to join us with our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the highest level of Jannah al-Firdaus and to grant us firmness and to grant us sincerity and to grant us the strength to continue. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to rectify us and to rectify through us and to guide us and to guide through us. Allahumma ameen. Barakallahu li wa lakum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.